Recording in progress. Got everybody looking at me, so I guess it's time to get started. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I feel kind of really stuck behind this little desk, and I do have a wandering microphone, so I'm just going to switch to that. Um, Hello. Am I missing? Uh, press the button. Oh, yeah, that kind of helps. On. Look at that. Okay, so um, so welcome everybody to the products and services session. Um, this morning we are very excited to see you up and about. Apparently there was karaoke last night, so congratulations on making it here. Um, for those of you that have made it, um, Paul Wilson, royalty walking in the room. Um, so it just struck me when I was doing the uh, welcome session yesterday that this is APNIC 56 and we serve 56 economies. How cool is that? So along with the 30th uh, anniversary, which is wonderful to have you all here. Um, so my name is Carla Scada. I am the Director for of Services at APNIC. And um, I wanted to just introduce the people that are going to be talking here today, um, who they're going to come up in succession and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing for the last six months, and in fact, probably more than 12 months, um, and take you on a journey. Uh, what over the last six months and then what we're planning to do in the, the upcoming couple of months. So um, are we going to start off today with George Odagi, who some of you, you can stay there, George, I'm going to go through the whole thing. You can 
wave. Um, so George is going to start off talking about the um, historical resource reclaim project that we've just wrapped up and um, let you know how we've done with that. And uh, some very exciting results there that we're incredibly proud of. It's been a huge effort by the team. And, um, and so we're really pleased with the outcome. So he's going to start us off. And then Andre is going to take us on a little journey. Um, so Andre is the uh, product manager for membership product. So everything to do with um, my Epinic, Andre, wave. Hi, you'll see him later. Anything to do with my Nick, he's your man. And um, um, he's we're going to take you on a little journey about what has happened um, or how you would interact with our products over uh, the course of your history with, um, with interacting with us as an organization. Um, then after that, we have, who's next, Raf? Oh, Lily. Yes, sorry, Lily. My favorite UX designer. She's always embarrassed when I say that, but it is true. I'm sorry for all the other UX designers. Um, Lily spends all of her time tracking your little fingerprints to see how you're interacting with our products online and, um, and looks for opportunities to develop and improve them. Um, Lily, if you haven't met her yet, she's actually got a little booth next to the products and services uh, booth on the lounge there. So please go and have a chat to her. She's always looking for feedback from members. Um, and then I think we've got Raf, Tom. <laughs> I should have looked at the schedule. Um, Tom. So Tom is king of registry. So <laughs> he, uh, he looks after the registry. So this is really the core of what we do at APNIC. And um, uh, so he's got a, a massive task to do. Um, and there's a lot of improvements that have happened recently that I think you'll find very exciting. And then we've got Raf. Okay, finally get to Raf. Uh, Raf is the, the, the product manager for the information products. And um, so he's also going to tell you about some of the things that has happened in his area. And um, and then finally, we've got Chi Hu, who is, I always refer to him as APNIC royalty, because um, he has been involved with APNIC, you were mentioned yesterday in the 30th anniversary, um, very long time, part, served on the EC before he actually joined as part of the secretariat. So um, he's going to talk to you about some of the things that have happened in training and, um, and also the infrastructure, um, some of the changes that have happened there. So um, now, George, you can come on up. And um, oh, and by the way, if you stay till the end, we have um, a few questions for you and we have a few little giveaways. So stick around and, um, and enjoy. Thanks, George. Thanks, Carla. I can just get these slides, please. Cool. Cool. cool, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, ohayou gozaimasu. Uh, my name is George. I work in the services team, and today I'll be giving you an update on the wrap-up of the historical resource transition project, and um, also going into the projection or our projection, um, which based on the outcome of this project and how it will impact the IFB4 uh, available pool. So for those of you who don't know what historical resources are, um, they are IPB4 addresses and AS numbers that were delegated prior to the existence of APNIC. Um, over the years, the APNIC community um, ran a few projects, one being the early transfer registration project and the other being the AUNIC to APNIC migration, which involved migrating those resources into the APNIC database. Um, and because there was no formal agreement between the custodians and APNIC at the time, uh, these, managed, uh, these resources were not managed under a policy framework. <clears throat> so in 2021, the APNIC EC uh, passed the resolution which requires all historical resources to manage those uh, resources under an account uh, and failing to do so would mean that those WHOIS registration records would be removed from the WHOIS and we would mark them as reserved. This means that they were not delegated to anyone and they were not available for delegation. Uh, interestingly, uh, in 2004, uh, JPNIC ran a similar project where they, uh, over three years, they contacted um, about 105 organizations 
um, to help them claim their resources. Um, and as a result, just under 320,000 IP addresses were uh, able to be um, put into a frozen state for one year and then reclaimed. <clears throat> Earlier this year it, uh, at the Manila, Manila conference in uh, Apricot, uh, Prop 147, uh, the policy proposal reached consensus and was implemented this year. And this allows uh, historical resource holders to claim uh, those resources within 12 months from the date that they were marked as reserved. And after those 12 months, those resources would be placed in the free pool for redelegation. Uh, so in 2021, uh, the, after the EC passed the resolution, um, we started getting our systems and processes ready. And uh, we started to identify all the custodians that we need to contact. Um, and then started putting um, cases into the, our Salesforce uh, case management system. And then in 2022, uh, we started getting the comms ready, our emails, and started working on those cases. And then this year, we started to wrap up the project um, and we reserved and recycled um, some unclaimed historical resources. Uh, so here you can see the case outcome snapshot. Uh, for, uh, in March 2022 last year, they were marked as yet to contact. And as we started to work through these cases, um, they were changed to prefixes being claimed. Um, and the successful ones were changed to prefixes retained by the holder. Um, some of them were no response and not contactable. Um, but as you can see in the graph here, um, there's a quite a big change from get to contact to being claimed. Here we have a, a, a case outcome snapshot of the total cases that we have, and I'll go more into detail about each of the case types and what actions have been taken by us. So firstly, there were 744 cases retained by the custodians. Um, that was about 3.7 million IP addresses. So for these, uh, the custodians were able to complete the declaration forms properly, um, and they were approved and managed under an APNIC account. Um, so we updated the registration records in the WHOIS um, and included org objects, IT objects with the most up-to-date information. Next, we have 101 cases, which were marked for return to APNIC, just over 100,000 IP addresses. And so the, for these cases, the custodians completed a declaration form to renounce those resources. Um, and therefore, those resources were recycled er earlier this year in February. Uh, we had 69 cases which were reclaimed under the recovery of unused historical resource policy, just over 550,000 IP addresses. Um, these resources had never been routed and um, after much effort to contact the custodians, they were unsuccessful. Um, so those resources were also recycled in February this year. Next, we have 282 cases where they were no longer needed, just under 100,000 IPs. Um, for these, the custodians informed us that they no longer re uh, require the resources, um, but for some reason they were either unable to complete the declaration forms or they just didn't want to. Um, so we've removed the registrations um, from the WHOIS and marked them as reserved. <clears throat> Next, uh, we have 1,232 uh, non-contactable contactable cases, just over a million IP addresses. Uh, for these cases, um, the WHOIS contacts that we had on record um, were all outdated. Uh, we made a lot of effort to try find their contact details online um, via our contacts, um, but they were unsuccessful and those resources were not routed. So the registration was also removed and we marked them um, as reserved. Next, we've got 377 cases as no response, out of which 21 were routed. Um, just over 450,000 IPs in total. Uh, for these, we sent multiple emails to the custodians. We also um, were able to contact the upstream providers and also um, with the appreciated help of the NIRs and in some cases, the other RIRs, um, we were able to get them to help us um, contact the custodians. But even then, um, for some of them, no response was received. They didn't want to claim them. Um, so after some time, we removed the registration and marked them uh, as preserved. Uh, one thing to point out here is that um, this time last year, we had about 2,500 uh, no response cases and half of which were routed. Um, so um, considering that, we think it's quite a big success that we were able to get those cases down after working through them this year. 
Next, we've got 288 uh, cases that did not complete the claims process, just over 530,000 um, non-routed IP addresses. Uh, for these, the resource claim forms weren't completed properly, uh, but we did hear back from them. Um, either they could not provide evidence of the custodianship, um, some were approved, but they didn't complete the membership application form. Um, and so after giving them some time, um, if they hadn't claimed it, we removed the registration and marked them as reserved. So we still have a few pending cases that we're working on. Um, there's 191 cases currently being claimed by the custodians, some awaiting um, legal escalation, but we are working to get those um, sorted as soon as possible. And we've got about 17 cases routed without authority. Um, so those cases are generally where the upstream has continued to announce those prefixes, but the uh, custodians have advised us that they no longer need it. So we've given the upstream some time to stop the announcements and then we will reserve those addresses. So in summary, uh, just over 3.7 million IPs that have been retained by custodians, uh, just over 650,000 recycled this year, uh, 2.1 million um, reserved in total and 864,000 IPs still pending to be claimed or reserved. And finally, uh, the, our, pro our projection. Uh, so in August last year, there was just over 10,000 slash 24s that would be uh, available in the free pool. And then in February this year, uh, it went up to 12,000 due to the recovery from the unused historical resource policy. Um, and our recent delegation trends show that we are delegating about 300 slash 24s per month, including the NIRs and APDIC members. Um, but then um, we once you take into account about 40 to 50 slash 24s that have been recovered each month from account, the usual account closure recovery process, um, it roughly averages to about 250 slash 24s per month that we're delegating. Um, and as you can see from the blue dotted line, that was the, um, the previous uh, estimated prediction of when exhaustion would happen in 2027. But with this additional 2.1, roughly um, million IP addresses that will be recycled next year. Uh, we believe that it will extend the exhaustion to around 2029. Um, but one thing to note here is that it's based on a few assumptions. Firstly, that the uh, delegation trends don't change significantly. Secondly, um, that the 2 million IP addresses will all be reserved. Not too many people will come back and claim. And lastly, um, any policy changes that may affect the maximum delegation size will change these numbers slightly. But overall, um, we believe that, yeah, this project has um, extended the exhaustion of the available pool for a few years. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thanks, George. Um, I think, uh, again, if you see somebody from products and services, go and have a chat to them at the lounge, give them a high five. This has been a, a phenomenal project. And I think that the result, if you just think about the summary, A, we've released a, a, a lot of resources back into the, the free pool, um, or potentially that looks like that, um, it seems like that will happen in the next 12 months. Um, but also those uh, addresses, those custodians that came back and verified their information has done a lot to actually increase the accuracy of our data. So we're very proud of that project and um, congratulations. Thank you very much, George. And um, yeah, to the team. So, oh, yeah. sorry. Hi, sorry. Out of concern. So I have a, a request or a comment here. So, uh, in case any resources, which is from my country, India, and if you are not able to trace or not able to contact the resource, legacy resource holder, uh, request to let me also know so that I can help you out mm. instead of taking back if you are not able to. Oh, trace. thank you. Um, and very much appreciated. We um we we have already um made use of your your assistance. Um, so we're obviously careful about what information we release that's private. But hundred percent, if we need any assistance, very much appreciate that offer. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Garb. Thanks. Andre. Thanks, Andre. Do you want this?
All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre Galblom. I'm the product manager for membership at APNIC. Uh, let me just get my a hang with this little thing here. Do I have to point it somewhere? One second. There you go. Um, so today I'd like to talk about all the products and services we have. Now, uh, it's APNIC's 30th anniversary, and over that time, we've developed lots of products and services, and it's all based on the feedback from our members <clears throat> and the community as a whole. We have so many of them that it's not always clear when you would want to use some of these products, when you would want to use the right one at the right time. So I'd like to visit this through the eyes of someone who needs IPv4. Um, that'll help us better understand the journey that someone would take through these various products and services. <clears throat> Let's meet Kit. So Kit runs a small ISP in Hong Kong. He's, re he's received a slash 32 uh, IPv4 from APNIC, but his small little ISP is growing. And so he needs a couple more ISP, uh, IPv4s. <clears throat> so what does Kit do? Well, the first thing he's going to do is chat to someone at APNIC. So he goes across to the contact page at APNIC. It's his first real experience other than using my APNIC to delegate some of the resources. This is the first time he's really had to reach out to APNIC's uh, support desk. <clears throat> he talks to Lou, the sweet girl over there. I just want to make sure that arrow is working. Yep. Um, and uh, she advises him that under his current policy, under the current policies, he's only allowed a slash 32 uh, maximum. Uh, and so his options are either to use the, um, uh, either to um, get some more IPv6 addresses, because that would be the better way to go, or you can use the uh, transfer um, service. So Kit has a little bit of information, but what he realizes is that he, he he needs a lot more. He doesn't really understand how the transfers work at APNIC. He's never done one before. Uh, and he definitely doesn't know enough about IPv6. So what's he going to do? We have a help center. Um, Kit jumps onto that help center and he learns more about his options, specifically around IPv4, IPv4 transfers. Um, while he's at the help center, which has a, a lot of uh, really good help, um, he's, he, he comes across the fact that we have a mailing list. Uh, and we also have a web interface with a mailing list called Orbit. Uh, and on this mailing list, is a, there's a transfer mailing list where he can sort of meet with other people that are similar in the same sort of predicament as himself. Uh, and he's able to use Orbit to find out more about um, and ask a few questions on Orbit about how the transfer would work. Having done this, uh, he realizes that he actually needs more information. He needs to get some actual formal training. So what he does is he moves along across to our Academy product. Yeah, he enrolls in a couple of courses. He notices we have a IPv6 foundation course and a planning course. Um, and he also sees that we have a, um, a um, route management course, which he enrolls in. While he's at the academy, he notices that we do have a technical assistance platform. And on this technical assistance platform, he can reach out to experts. Uh, some of the experts on this platform, one of them that was there was Terry. You would have seen him around here. He's at the conference today. Um, Terry informs him of all sorts of additional courses he can take, but he also lets him know that we have some really good and amazing um, insights into industry experts across the, across the globe. It tells him about the ping podcast that we have, which uh, Kit gets quite excited about and listens to. And uh, he also tells him about the blog. Uh, the blog has a lot of information. Uh, Kit actually loses himself for a couple of hours in the blog when he should be doing work. Um, but he manages to pull himself out and get back to work. But having spent so much time looking at all this information and all these products, he realizes what he really would like to do is actually connect a little bit more with the community. So what Kit does is he decides that he wants to attend one of the conferences. Uh, Kit wants to network, he wants to meet people, and he feels a little bit more connected to the community once he does go to a conference. Um, when he's at the conference, he even might meet up with Lou, the first person he spoke to at APNIC when he, when he reached out. Having attended the conference, Kit feels very... The kid feels like he has the knowledge he needs. He's ready to make a jump. He's he's visited the academy. He's uh, planned his IP four address, uh, IPv six addresses. Uh, he's um, visited the help center. He's gone to a conference. He's gone to orbit, and he honestly feels like he has enough knowledge now based on the products and services that we at APNIC offer. 
and he's ready to make the plunge. Kit then heads across to my APNIC, which has the IPv4 transfer listing service, uh, and he finds a match. He finds um, someone who's able to uh, offer IPv4 addresses, uh, and he's able to uh, negotiate a deal with this person. Before he's ready to commit and jump into the IPv4, he wants to make sure that the quality of the resources are correct. So he uses NEDOX, one of our um, uh, products in the information services, um, just to understand a little bit more about the quality of the resources he wants to get. And he also goes across to the who is data, uh, who was database to understand more about how the transfer history for these resources might have happened over time. Once Kit is ready to accept these resources, he goes across to my APNIC and uh, inside my APNIC he's able to receive the resources he's purchased or uh, not purchased, the resources he's um, uh, negotiated with the, the other person for. And while he's there, he's also he also decides that he would like to sign up uh, and request more IPv6. Once he's received these resources, what I, our kit can then do is go across to RDAP, uh, make sure that he has configured and set up them correctly and that they actually verify the ownership in his in in his account uh, and while he's there he also uses the other information service uh, product that we have called dash which allows him to set up alerts for the new resources he has kit has traveled and come across a lot of our products uh, he's feeling empowered he now feels like he has all the information he needs he's got the products and service he's got the resources that he needs um, but there's two more things that he's found really interesting. One of them was the fellowship program that APNIC runs. Uh, he's got a young intern, a young um, a person that works with him that he would like to send on this fellowship program because he believes there'll be a lot of value for her. And the other thing that he wants to do is start participating in policy so that he can, uh, so he can help mold the outcomes for his own small ISP. So Kit is then able to go across to the policy uh, pages on our website, as well as participate in many of the policy debates on um, the orbit and the mating list. So Kit now feels empowered. He's part of a community. He spent time learning about our products, learning about the services. He didn't realize that he could actually do half the stuff that he was able to achieve. And having attended the conferences, he's really starting to feel like he's part of a community of people that uh, are like-minded to himself. Um, Kit is successful and uh, his ISP is um, booming. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Before you disappear, are there any questions for Andre on that journey? I hope you were paying attention because there may be some questions later about the products that you've interacted with um, along your journey with APNIC. So um, thanks, Andre. Thanks very much. Lily. Okay, so Lily's going to talk, talk to you some more about some of this journey and, and um and how uh, she's viewing what's happening in APNIC and how we gather your feedback. Thanks, Lily. Thank you. It's really high. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Lily and I am here to talk to you today about feedback. Um, overall, the journey of feedback involves pathways to giving feedback um, and what happens to your feedback. But in between all of that, we're also trying to figure out ways that we can improve the feedback mechanism at APNIC. So these are the three main mechanisms that are involved in this entire process. Collect is the most important step because without collect, we won't have anything to work off of. And so let's go through what this involves. There are many paths one can take to provide feedback to APNIC. Now have a moment to think to yourself, which ones 
are you currently aware of? And which ones have you already been engaged in? This is all the touch points we have. You're not meant to read the slide because there's a lot, <laughs> um, but basically this is an illustration of how many different places that you can be involved with um, and also make use of, provide feedback with, uh, and really our entire experience encompasses all of these tiny little touch points throughout our products and services. So one of them would be member services. Uh, you can see these guys at APNIC help desk um, just out there in the hallway. You can talk to them through a chat online. Uh, and of course, there's always tickets. So uh, there's face-to-face -face engagements and there's also online um, engagements. But overall, these are the people that would help you if you ever ran into trouble, if you ever needed questions answered, they're always there for you. And then there's user research. So this is a little bit uh, on the other side of member services where we don't really want to wait until something is wrong to fix it. This is where we actively ask you, how are you using this? What features would you like to see? What improvements to these existing features would you like to see? Does this menu make sense to you? Uh, does additional information as a label sound like, you know, something that's too vague. And so this is an example of where we did some tree testing and click testing uh, and people told us, yeah, you know, we don't like the label additional information. That's the most selected wrong path that leads people to go into pages that where they get lost. Um, also, we have, you know, prototypes that we go through so that we can be sure that a flow makes sense for a new feature. Um, and of course, there's always blog, social media, Orbit. Uh, I know a lot of people actually haven't heard about Orbit still, but this is the evolution of our mailing lists. And this is the place where uh, people can be engaged in discussions. Um, and it's a web portal where everything you send an email is synced to a front end and archived. So you can read through it as it's a Facebook feed, which is really quite neat. Um, Trying to marry the two technologies together was a bit of a challenge, but I highly encourage everyone to go and take a look and be engaged in these discussions. And of course, surveys. Um, everyone hates surveys. Uh, we can be honest about that. But without surveys, we wouldn't be able to gather the massive big numbers, the big quantitative data, uh, and the, you know, the overall vision of you know where things are at how are we doing so we send these after almost every key engagement that we do there's the APNIC survey there's conferences fellowships um ev after every training event um after help desk engagements and so this is an opportunity for you to let us know how we're doing and how we can do it better so all of this feedback is collected and you might be wondering what happens to it so this comes to analyze this is the overall feedback review process um, and the product team process put together after this feedback is collected. You don't have to worry about the details here, but this goes to show how many steps we take to actually vet this kind of feedback. To process everything, we start with the raw data, with all the raw quotes you send, send to us verbatim, and we have a monthly review of everything collected through all the channels you saw in that big donut chat, uh, chart earlier. Um, and then we identify the ones that are actionable. We review them, we consult the relevant product teams, and go to figure out which steps to take. And we categorize them, sort them so that we can go back to them later. This will just be a small corner of, you know, pages and pages of spreadsheets we have with your feedback. And you can see like very real uh, comments that people send to us. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's about speed. Sometimes it's about support. Um, sometimes it's about UI. And it really doesn't matter what area it's in. We read and go through all of them. So never feel like your feedback is lost. It's all captured. And we actually read every single one of them. And the more detail you give us, the better we can act on it. So if you say something like, oh, things are okay, things are good, or very bad, very slow, 
not working, it doesn't actually help us to identify exactly what it is because we don't track all your clicks on your websites as much as you might think that we do. We really don't. We don't have that kind of personal data. So here comes the acting on feedback. This is the import impact effort matrix that you know most major tech companies to use to sort through their priority logs, their work. Um, why haven't the feedback you've given to us been actioned on already? Well, this is why. So if it's something that's very, very high impact and low effort in terms of development time, design time, uh, you know, from all the teams, then yes, it will absolutely get done and probably within like a month or something like that. Because it's very high impact, it will benefit a lot of people. And it's very easy to do. It might be, you know, an hour to half a day, a day worth of work. Um, and if it's high impact uh, and low, uh, sorry, low impact and low effort, then I am really sorry. It's probably not going to get done just simply because it's not uh, really worth our time. But you know, it's a it's in a maybe column. Uh, if it's high effort and low impact, then it's a lot of work for something that maybe most people would not find beneficial. Uh, so. Yeah, probably not. Um, again, high effort, high impact, it's a maybe, just because it's really worth doing because impact is high, but also it might take a very long time. So to you, it might feel like it's not getting done, but maybe you've forgotten about it. And it was something brought up two years ago and it took us two years to get some major piece of work finally pushed out to production and now it's live, but you've already forgotten about it. So there it is. Um, overall, this flowchart illustrates the decision and the planning and the prioritization uh, to a certain ticket or a piece of work. So it's dependent upon, you know, urgency, uh, severity, volume, um, how strong the signal is from the community and how much time it's going to take. If it's a quick win, then it goes straight to design and implementation. Uh, if it's something that needs to be investigated further, the product manager will add it to the backlog, we will check against any planning uh, or pre-planned existing work, and then we go through prioritization. Because every year APNIC publishes reports, and one of those reports is our activity plan. The activity plan is where you can find all of the work that we promised to deliver. And so we have to make sure that all of that is in accordance to each other and uh, planned out in a very coherent way. Then after all of that, it goes into our agile methodology and it will be implemented. So here are just some highlights of actions we've completed so far in 2023. Not going to go through all of them. Uh, you can read this on your own time. Um, and these are some of the things that are in progress. So uh, there are lots of improvements being worked on right now as we're at conference. There's still lots of staff back in our Brisbane office actively working on these projects. And so I will talk to you through three projects um, as examples of how we address feedback. First one is ASN linking. We received some feedback that for um, ASNs delegated to members, uh, and just for use by members themselves, it's very easy, uh, but it's not very clear for ASNs delegated to members who also, you know, flow it on to use by their customers. And so we don't know what who these customers are and they're not on the record. And so PeeringDB told us that it's very important for them to determine who operates a given ASN in any kind of circumstance. And so we worked on it um, and the registry team is, has uh, done a lot of work to improve uh, access to actual ASN operator data in who is an RDAP. Um, and Tom will go through this in more detail. Another example is the ROA publication improvements. So uh, I'm not sure how many of you have attended IETF, but this is a presentation from uh, IETF 116. Uh, the researchers presented this problem uh, with ROA creation times. And so ROAs took on average about 15 to 20 minutes to appear on the repository. And since then we've implemented a solution to speed this up, uh, to you know, reduce it down to about three minutes on average for most accounts. Um, now, some of the larger accounts uh, would you know, see maybe eight minutes, but uh, we would say it's still a significant uh, reduction in the time it takes to publish a ROA. 
And finally, we have another project called contact management. This is technically still in progress um, and we're rolling out phases of this project uh, slowly. Uh, we conducted quite a few user interviews over APNIC 54, which some of you have attended. And yes, I transcribed every single word everybody said to me during those interviews. Um, so the transcripts are very long, and this is why I always have my phone to record your voice if you come talk to me at my desk, because I can't possibly type fast enough, you know, as you're speaking to me. And I take this feedback very seriously. Uh, so we go back and we analyze, we underline things, highlight things uh, about what you said on logins and contacts, how it's confusing, how it's not easy to change, um, contact types and permissions, like what's a corporate contact? What's a technical contact? Does corporate include technical? Does Do I have to tick all the boxes or just tick one? Um, and also about MFA, which we were quite surprised about because uh, it's actually really troublesome to have to log into a website. Uh, you put your username, you put your password, and you have to pull out your phone, you have to open your authentication app, you have to check the code. Uh, but surprisingly, we had overwhelming support from everyone we talked to. Uh, and they said, you know, many people will see it as a hassle, but in my opinion, the security is more important. And we go, great will implement the security measures. And so these uh, basically summarize the feedback that we received. And these are the major points that we will uh, actually uh, include in our project. Uh, so in the future, uh, one of the things you might see from a UI perspective that you can uh, open up in my opinion is when you invite a new contact to be added to your membership account uh, by default you will be able to choose uh, the contact type as you're adding this person and you can see a description of what each contact involves previously it would just say corporate technical billing and we expect you to know the difference and we quickly realized that no not everyone understands so we will actually put in okay what is a corporate contact what's a technical contact. And if you are a power user and you want to configure advanced permissions, you can always open up that option and configure each individual permission uh, as you need. And so this uh, is not the only change. There are quite a few other changes in the contact management experience in my opinion, um, but you will see that being rolled out quite soon towards the end of this year or early next year. So these are the key points. Uh, first, we want to consolidate authorization so that every account contact has an APNIC login and you're authenticated and you know who is doing what on your account. Uh, we clarify the contact types and the permissions in the UI, and we're going to retire contacts with an APNIC login. And this will happen slowly. We'll give you lots of time to sort it out between you know, employees, uh, and we will implement multi-factor authentication as a mandatory requirement requirement for all APNIC login users. Uh, in terms of timeline, here it is. Um, it will be fully completed by July 2024, and you will see emails coming uh, in, the, in the future months uh, telling you, OK, now you should do this. Now you should do this. And at a certain point, uh, you know, people who don't have a login will no longer be authorized to act on your APNIC member account. So. Really, we're trying to improve feedback from first collections, bring it all the way back to the beginning, because that's where all of this work starts. We used to have a general feedback button on the side of our website, which a lot of people found confusing because they thought it was live chat or it, it was something else, or we would just get a lot of spam, like great, um, some gibberish, uh, and you know things like NA, uh, good, and it just wasn't very helpful to us we received this huge volume of feedback that we had to come through and most of it was not helpful. And so also we couldn't you know, run it on every product because it was actually a pretty expensive tool to run on the website. And so we're going to create a new feedback form to replace the feedback button that we used to have. And it's meant to be more straightforward and also at the same time, help us to parse and sort through a wide range of feedback. And so this is what we have right now in our drafts. 
um, you have the option to stay anonymous or be contactable. So, you know, you submit a piece of feedback, we might email you back and say, hey, can you elaborate on this point? Can you explain what happened here? What did you mean by this? Uh, and then you can choose the categories. It could be a general comment, it could be a bug um, or a question or an idea for a suggestion. Um, and so, yeah, we will be able to put this in the footer uh, of our website, any page of our website, you can always go to it and find the feedback form. And so I'll just be out in the hallway, like all of today and all of tomorrow. So please stop by, have a chat, um, and we would really love to hear from you. Thank you very much. That's all for me today. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Lily. Um, if you haven't got the message yet, we really want to hear from you. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it's it's as I said in the beginning. This is it's we call it my APNIC. It's your APNIC. And so anything that you feel that there could be improvements, um, sometimes I think you all understand you get a little bit too close to the product and um, we really need your view to, um, to help us with improvements and obviously not only my APNIC, but um, the other products as well. So um, Tom is going to talk to us about some of the things that he's done, mostly around the, um, the, the implementation of the new prop 150 151 um and uh and some of the changes to rpki so tom thank you very much uh good morning okay so since the last meeting we have uh five things that we've completed. The first one is the Prop 150 policy implementation. Uh, the second is the Prop 151 policy implementation. We've made some improvements to the speed of raw publication. Uh, the geofeed attribute has been added to the Whois database. And we've done the public Whois component of the ASN delegation identity work. A couple of things that are still in progress are alternative who is authorization, which is about replacing uh, passwords with uh, AUTH tokens, and also the registry API. And some work that we're looking at for next year is the RPKI signed checklist implementation. So first with the Prop 150 implementation, this is a policy that was endorsed uh, earlier this year. and. What it was about was preventing users from uh, creating rows or who is route or route six objects with private uh, reserved or unallocated ASNs. And the reason for this is simply that those objects shouldn't be appearing in public routing. Uh, in private routing is fine, but uh, not in public. So if they're in these databases, which are about public routing, then something's gone wrong and needs to be fixed up. So that was the motivation for the change. There are various of these objects in Whois and RPKI today. So we're working with the holders of those objects to get them cleaned up. We contacted them in late June. So we went with a three month notice period for fixing them. So all things being equal, we'll be deleting those in uh, later in this month. And an important aspect of this work is that delegated RPKI isn't affected. Uh, at the Secretariat, we have the ability to delete objects from Whois and delete ROAS in hosted APNIC systems, but delegated systems are run by the members. So we can't reach in and delete ROAS from those uh, from those setups. Um, yeah, so that's just something to take into account with the implementation. Next, we have the Prop 151 implementation, and this is about preventing the creation of new AS set objects with non-hierarchical names. So previously, when creating an AS set object in Whois, you could use a hierarchical or a non-hierarchical name. And a, hier a hierarchical name is where the object has a parent object being either an ortnum or another AS set object. So for example, if you have AS1, 
and you want to create an AS set for your customers, you can create that with a name like AS1 colon AS customers. Uh, to, and then creating that object will require the authorization of that parent uh, ortnum. The alternative way is to use a non-hierarchical name, like for example, just AS customers, and that's unconnected with any other object in whois, and anybody can create an object like that. And the problem with the non-hierarchical names is that there are various uh, IRR databases in the world, and they don't coordinate as to those non-hierarchical names. So the problem that actually prompted the equivalent work in the RIPE region was that Amazon had an AS set in RADB called AS Amazon, and somebody went and created an object called AS Amazon in the RIPE database. So if you have prefix filter generation logic that looks at both RADB and RIPE, and it was looking for the AS Amazon AS set object, that would have worked correctly up until that RIPE object appeared. And then it possibly could have started looking at that ripe object instead, and you get bad configuration as a result. So that's the motivation for uh, for this change. Existing objects don't need to be changed. It's not part of the implementation that non-hierarchical names in the APNIC database uh, need to be transitioned to hierarchical names. In some instances, that can be uh, quite a lot of work where customers and peers are configured with the existing uh, name. So yeah, members can just continue using what they're using today. The key thing really here is that the APNIC who is database isn't a vector for non-hierarchical names that could cause problems for people who depend on those names in other databases. The next thing we've done is uh, some improvements to row publication speed. This was prompted by the paper that you can see on this slide. The researchers as part of that work were measuring the time it took after row creation for objects to appear in repositories, uh, to reach validators, and then to actually take effect in routing. And like the slide on Lily's, uh, in Lily's slide pack showed, there's, uh, there was a delay for publication from APNIC because we were actually doing it on a scheduled basis every um, 20 minutes. So the average time for an object to reach the repository was 10 minutes uh, as a result. So we switched that over to just issuing the objects immediately rather than having that run as part of a scheduled job to address that problem. And the time for publication is now much more in line with, uh, for example, RIPE or Afrinic. Um, so for almost all accounts, it's dropped down from an average of 15 minutes to uh, three minutes. So it's much more prompt for those objects to take effect in production. We've added the GeoFeed attribute to Whois. Um, for those who aren't aware, GeoFeed is a file format for associating geographical location information with networks. It's quite popular. It's well supported by a lot of the bigger geolocation providers. And before doing this work, if people wanted to put this information into the Whois database, they needed to use one of the free form remarks attributes. So something like remarks, and then the string geofeed, and then the URL. So now we have a first class geofeed attribute per that RFC on the slide. So things are much clearer for consumers and less hackish, uh, basically. We don't have hosting for the GeoFeed files ourselves. If people want to do this, they still need to find somewhere to actually upload it. We don't think it's necessary for us to do this because there are lots of options in this space. Uh, you can put the file on GitHub. Um, there are, I think it's called Open Geolocate is, or Open GeoFeed is a site that will give you a free, give you free GeoFeed file hosting. Uh, but having said that, this is supported by LACNIC. Um, so feedback here from people who think this functionality would be useful uh, would be appreciated. The next thing is the public component of the ASM delegation identity work. The, this project was about being able to clearly distinguish ORTNUM records in who is uh, the ones that are delegated to members in their own right from the ones that are delegated to uh, members' customers. And the way we're doing this is pretty much just copying what RIPE do. So instead of having the org object in a customer ASN point to the member, 
it instead points now to the customer. And there's a new attribute called sponsoring org that points to the member. So it's possible to see uh, how that relationship is set up by way of the who is data. So we've updated the existing ortnum records to have this model. We still have a little bit of work to do in the various portals to allow administering this, uh, this data though. And as far as upcoming work goes, we're planning to have a beta instance of the registry API available later in late October. Uh, the difference between this and the test bed that was done last year is that the beta service will actually cause changes in production, but we just want to have it available, uh, to have limited availability for a period of time to help shake out problems before making it generally uh, available. The alternative who is authorization work is mostly in hand, but we'd like to have the registry API out first so that we have a better upgrade path for people who are APNIC members, because instead of having to update uh, the email scripts to use tokens, they should be able to transition to the registry API. So we're holding off on that for the time being. And then with RPK assigned checklists, we had planned on doing that work uh, this year. It got deferred due to policy implementations and other things. And that's now planned for 2024. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, this is Yoshino Matsaki from IAG. I have a question about uh, the hierarchical uh, asset. And then uh, now uh, we are enforcing the use of the hierarchical asset for members. And once um, S is returned to Epinic, um, associated asset must be uh, deleted because uh, if it's reassigned uh, some errors, uh, we have uh, some confliction there. So do you have any policy or procedure for that? That's a good point. Uh, I'm not sure what happens with hierarchical assets when the ORT num is removed, but I think I think you're right that the only good option there is to remove them. So yeah, we'll have a look at our process. And uh, also, uh, there's a minor case of, on the transfer, right? So if something outgoing must be uh, deleted, but uh, if uh, acquire or something merger, then maybe we need to keep it as is. So we, we might have some corner cases, so please consider that too. Thank you very much. That's a good point. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, a lot going on there and, um, and a, a lot of really significant improvements, which um, obviously Lily and Tom both pointed to in terms of how we how quickly we're we responding. Um, so, and Raf, would you like to come up and share what's happening with the information product? Thanks, Carla. Uh, my name is Rafael Sintra. I'm the product and delivery manager for the information products. And today we'll be covering the release of Global Rex. Uh, also, Nerox is now available in Japanese. Uh, some upcoming work uh, that we are doing, uh, Dash widget in the MyAppinic dashboard, RPKI and then SEC measurements in Rex. And finally, I'll be talking a little bit about Dash, uh, and in particular routing status alerts and the new notification channels we are working on. So to start with um, Rex, so for those not familiar with Rex, Rex is the APNIC Resource Explorer. Uh, it provides multiple statistics on internet number resource delegation, IPv6 deployment, and um, visualizations on AES interconnections. So we had a new release of Rex next month, and uh, the new release now provides delegation and measuring data for the whole world. Uh, previously, it only pro provided data for uh, Asia Pacific region. Uh, we made multiple improvements in the back end, and now we rely entirely on public data sources like delegate stats and transfer logs from all of the other uh, regional um, uh, RARs. 
So you can see on the image, this is an example of IPv6, IPv4, and ASN distribution uh, figures. So these are the number of delegations made by all RIRs for the whole world. This is the same chart, but now with added information uh, per region. Uh, we made also multiple improvements for the delegations page. So previously, we only had the original date for the delegations. So this was a little bit confusing uh, for uh, users when the resource was trans transferred. So we added a transfer date column. Uh, so now when listing the, the resources, if there is a transfer, we will also show that the last transfer date. Uh, in the image, we have uh, IPv6 deployment measurements for all the regions. So again, previously, you only had this data for Asia Pacific. And finally, uh, this is the AS interconnections visualization. Uh, this is um, for our out of region, in this case, Netherlands. So now we also provide for um, other regions, uh, or, or other economies, these, these feature. So you can see on the right side, this is the location filter. So all data in RECs now can be filtered by RIR economies, individual regions, sub-regions, and uh, economies. So we also provide mutual selection that allows you to compare um, multiple locations. We also added a filter by RIR, um, and given some feedback that we received, we also be implementing NIR filter next year. Now, NEROX. So for those not familiar with NEROX, NEROX is APNIC Network Operator Toolbox. Uh, it's a service provided in collaboration with RIPE and uh, provides a set of tools to analyze networks. It's great for uh, investigating and solving routing issues. So this project uh, was a collaboration with JPNIC that uh, provided the translation. So special thanks to Taiji-san and Hiromo-san that work with our team to make this project possible. We do hope that the translation uh, will make NEROX more accessible to the Japanese internet community. So I'll show a few examples of uh, the, the Japanese translation. So this is the routing status and routing history widgets. We also translated uh, BGPlay. So BGPlay, it's a very popular tool from RIPE that allows you to replay the BGP status uh, states for different inter internet number resources. And finally, this is the comparison mode in NEROX. So this tool allows you to uh, add multiple internet number resources and analyze them side by side. So you can see on the left-hand side, the translation in Japanese of this feature. Now, talking about up upcoming work, uh, starting with the dash widget in my APNIC dashboard. So this will allow any member logging to my APNIC to have a quick overview of any routing uh, issues they have, or if they have any suspicious traffic coming from their network. And also if they have created um, dash alerts, uh, they will also have a quick snapshot of any alerts uh, firing. This work is planning to be released on the fourth quarter. We are also working on adding RPKI and DNSSEC measurements to RECs. Uh, this data com comes from APNIC Labs, and you can see some mockups for the new feature. Now, uh, 
dash routing status. Uh, this was released last year. I won't get into the uh, detail here because it was already covering previous meetings, but basically routing status allows our members to visualize any routing issues in their network. Um, so basically all the, uh, we get all the BGP routes for our members and we compare against RPKI and IRR. And if there is a problem, we will show, we will notify the, the member. We also provide uh, routing status alerts that allows members to be notified about routing consistencies, uh, missing rows or route objects, and also unexpected or missing BGP routes. Uh, this is an example of uh, an alert. So in, at the end of June uh, uh, this year, there was a massive uh, BGP leak in Singapore. And on the right side, you can see an example of an email that one of our members would have received. So in this case, um, Dash is alerting that unexpected BGP announcement was detected. So Dash Alerts currently supports email, SMS, and Slack. Uh, we receive uh, feedback from the community uh, during APNIC 54. And uh, based on this um, feedback, we are now also implementing support for WhatsApp and webhooks. And it's planned for the last quarter of this year. And that's all I have, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Raf. Um, I think Dash has certainly had has been very popular um, in the community. We've had some fantastic feedback on that product um, as we have interacted or people have had the opportunity to interact with it at some of the NOGs. They've gone, wow, this is amazing. So please spread the word. Um, okay, and then I'm now going to hand over to Chi Hu, who is going, he's got a massive portfolio that he's responsible for at APNIC. So um, there's a lot of uh, work that's being condensed into a very short period of time uh, that Chihu's going to share with you. Thanks, Chihu. Uh, thank you, Carla. Okay, uh, I'm Chihu Chang. Uh, I'm the Infrastructure and Development Director at APNIC. Uh, and I have the internal technical infrastructure as well as external internet development work under me. So that's why I will have uh, two presentations. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, firstly, I'll talk a bit about the training and development part. Um, we have been doing a lot of like uh, training and development work. Uh, so a lot of things I think uh, over uh, this year would be, of course, to scale up uh, the work that we do, as well as, you know, um, uh, improving the con uh, improving the platform that we have. Uh, to support everything. Uh, the platform that I'm talking about is the Academy platform. And this year, uh, you know, the main change, uh, as at least is more visible to all of you, would be uh, we have successfully migrated uh, the training wiki into uh, the Academy platform um, so that, like, you know, everything uh, can be accessible from one platform and uh, for improved user experience and access to the course materials. As you can see on the screen uh, shot on the right side, uh, you, uh, the students uh, or attendees of the training can have you know, uh, all the materials needed uh, on the academy platform, including the agenda, the trainer information, the, call, uh, uh, the training materials, as well as other reference uh, information. I think it's very, very handy. And, uh, you know, people don't need to go to another platform for this kind of information. So this is very good. And, um, and of course, you know, uh, we also add on a lot of new materials into the platform, including like eights. Uh, new virtual labs published and also uh in fact this is a, the latest uh, information uh, uh my colleagues uh, actually share 
uh, the information up to yesterday. <laughs> so it's very, very new. Um, and uh, we have done 135 online hybrid face-to-face -face training events. Uh, you know, those are instructor-led training in uh, 27 economies and with like 3,000 plus uh, participant um, participation uh, completion. Uh, so, which is very, very good. Uh, as you can see, we have scaled up our training quite a lot. I'll talk more about that. And also we have supported uh, 36 technical community events. Um, so I hope uh, what uh, we are doing is very, very, you know, uh, useful and impactful uh, to the community that we serve. Um, of course, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we want to scale up our training and development work. Uh, one of the like, program that we are doing is to recruit uh, community trainers because we need more people to help us, especially uh, those experts uh, on the ground. Um, so we have this uh, retained community trainers. We have been doing it for uh, one and a half years. And uh, so the focus is, of course, to hire someone to help us to do instructor-led training, to do technical assistance, and to help uh, you know their relevant community, uh, you know, to grow and uh, like maybe uh, to support the NOx and 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 use the NOx platform to share experience among themselves. And also, uh, from time to time, we ask them to help us to develop or review our training materials. Uh, and of course, there are benefits, and uh, we'll you know pay them uh, like monthly retainer fee. Uh, so this is a very very good program to help us to scale up the training. Um, and um, the most up to date information is uh, we now have nine active retained community trainers in uh, you know these. Uh, economies listed uh, and we still hope to get more uh, because with them we can do a lot more work in the you know, relevant economies of course our focus would be the developing uh, countries economies or at least developed uh, countries economies um, and and it's also a challenge because in uh, those areas there may not be you know uh, enough experts uh, to help us uh, but anyway uh, please help spread the word um, to, to like uh, if you know someone uh, who are good uh, in both like uh, technical uh, knowledge and as well as doing training um, uh, it's a challenge you know some uh, we probably can get people uh, who, who, who are good in uh, technical knowledge but they may not be good at doing training uh, but anyway uh, uh, you know we, 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 we would do some development for them. Uh, if we, uh, you know, uh, can identify people who have the potential, uh, but the the key point is we need you know uh, to 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 uh, you know uh, identify uh, the people with the, the potential. But anyway, uh, please help, uh, especially if you know of uh, people who have that um, potential. Um, Another thing I want to highlight um, is the IXP development work uh, that we do at APNIC. Uh, we do strongly believe uh, instant exchange is very, very useful uh, you know, uh, for the internet development in the relevant countries' economies. And of course, uh, the IX would be our members because they need IP addresses and also the uh, participants that they serve are our members as well. So, you know, uh, I think, you know, is also, uh, you know, give us, you know, good justification to help. Them. Um, and and uh, we do a lot of this, uh, especially on the training and technical assistance side. And we have done a lot in like Fiji, PNG, Vanuatu, Mongolia, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, not just that, uh, we also would provide other support uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, including uh, equipment support. Uh, and uh, especially now we have uh, the agreement, uh, the MOU uh, with ISOC uh, uh, and also APNIC Foundation to help uh, support the equipment side. Uh, so, you know, when uh, you know, we identify the need and of course we hope the community can like, initiate that 
uh, and and come to us uh, to ask for support. Then, uh, yeah, we'll uh, do together with ISOC APX Foundation as well as APIX uh, to help you know, people develop the, the, the IXV to serve the relevant community. And uh, at the same time, we also encourage the IX uh, to join APIX and Manners as members. And uh, not just that, uh, you know, we also help, uh, you know, uh, grow the uh, community and also uh, help with the ecosystem. And so we support APIX activity. We support Peering Asia to, you know, encourage peering. We support peering forums. Uh, mostly hosted by like nonprofit IXPs and also Knox, uh, because a lot of the uh, Knox, in fact, are supported by their uh, you know, IXP. Uh, and and as well as the tools um, for the IX, like Peering DB, IXP BB, as well as IXP Manager. And uh, so this is you know uh, the thing that we support, and we hope. Uh, with uh, the IXP development, then you know the whole uh, you know uh, community can grow together. Um, that's all I have for for the training and development side. Um, any questions, comments? Of course, it's just uh, quick updates. Uh, I haven't covered everything. Uh, we have done a lot, but this are uh, just the highlights. If not, I'll go to the next updates. It's related to infrastructure operations. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry. Next slide. Okay. Uh, last time uh, at Apricot, uh, I mentioned that uh, we would do a community consultation on the so called five nines. Uh, that's about availability. And uh, we later changed uh, the name to critical surface availability because you know we don't want to preempt people to think about five nights. Um, anyway, uh, this is to help us to understand more about you know what uh, our community thinks about this, uh, and so that to help us to determine what to do next. And. Uh, we didn't engage external consultant to help us. We use our own resources to do it. And uh, uh, we, we, we struggled quite a bit, but at the end, uh, we put up uh, the uh, survey uh, on the, you know, uh, in, in June. And then uh, over the uh, three week period, we uh, received 118 completions and 91 partial uh, completions uh, with a lot of members. Uh, you know, with larger organizations and uh, with people from larger organizations and, and smaller organizations. And uh, in addition to the survey, uh, we also did 11 interviews uh, with uh, 11 organizations, uh, mostly large service providers uh, with you know, like, uh, also root server operator and uh, uh, law enforcement agency and uh, NIR. Um, and uh, for each interview, it actually, uh, you know, a, a very, you know, extensive interview, uh, it took us like at least one hour and uh, some even took uh, two hours. Uh, and we actually get a, quite a lot of like, information from them. Uh, I, of course, I cannot, you know, uh, share the full report here, but I can give you some highlights. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll share the full report later. Um, and uh, I can share with you, like uh, we receive uh, like quite clear message that um, most members uh, think we should commit to a minimum level uh, of availability. And also they value uh, the availability of our technical staff 24 by seven. Uh, 
But as for like whether they are interrupted by APNIC outages, uh, seventy. 4% of the people agree that uh, their operations are rarely disrupted by uh, AP outages. Of course, one of the reasons is we seldom have uh, outages. Uh, but as for the impact to them, uh, like if there is like 15 minute outage, uh, you know, in uh, uh, you know, different surfaces, uh, we can see that like, um, uh, like most of them think, uh, you know, this is the weighted average. Uh, the impact to them is less than moderate. Uh, as for maybe just one highlight regarding like reverse DNS, if there's case of loss of uh, name server, uh, yeah, people, a lot of people think there's no impact at all. And uh, a lot of uh, them, of course, think the impact uh, was uh, more, uh, less than moderate as well. Um, and uh, for RPKI publication of availability, yeah, um, similar results uh, was received. And uh, as for you know uh, their readiness, uh, in fact, we know that like uh, almost half of the people uh, say they have the process and technology in place to mitigate uh, uh, outages uh, when mitigate uh, uh, issues that they have when uh, we have outages, while 26% uh, uh, don't. And as for, you know, whether they commit availability to, to their customers, users, you know, 55% uh, committed 99.95% and 75% uh, committed 99.99% uh, or less. Uh, so we have some idea about you know what they promise to their customers. As for asking them whether you know we should increase investment in availability, uh, forty percent opposed to that, and thirty one percent support. Uh, but they think you know data accuracy is more important. Um, so this is a very good indication to us as well. Uh, so. Uh, we have uh, some uh, conclusion, I should say. Uh, members are largely untroubled by the outages at this time. They rarely see uh, an impact. Uh, almost half say they have medication in place if outages uh, occur. And uh, the perceived impact of the potential outage is lower than moderate across surfaces. Uh, but 65% of them uh, say uh, APLIC should commit to a minimum level of availability. Uh, and members are not so supportive in further and uh, investment in availability, but they are more supportive in improving data accuracy. So based on that, uh, we have a draft plan. Uh, we would not set the five nights as the availability target of uh, critical surfaces, but we will continue to use four nights uh, as availability target of our critical surfaces. For less critical surfaces, we use 99.95 as uh, we have been doing uh, for uh, a number of years. And uh, by the same time, we will still uh, improve the monitoring and measurement of the availability. Uh, right now, we can only like measure, uh, you know, up to two decimal uh, digit, uh, and we uh, will improve to, you know, uh, measure up to three digits so that we can know how close we are to our targets. And also we'll publish the measurement methodology with a blog post. And at the same time, we'll continue to improve, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, our infrastructure and operations uh, when budget and resources allow, including uh, improve our change management process, the self-healing and recovery of application components with better automation, as well as improving 24 by 7 T1 support with outsourcing. Uh, as for the report, uh, of course, I only uh, share the highlights, uh, but the full report will be published in a few weeks and uh, along with a blog post. So you can understand more about what um, the, the people think uh, uh, with the survey. But that's probably it. Any question, comments? Any questions?
And there's a lot packed into that. Thank you, Chihu. Um, Thank you. I think uh, that was... Again, we kind of get an hour and a half to pack in a lot of stuff. So well done on, on making it to the end. Um, so there is one more slide, if I can ask our... Uh, can we just please have a round of applause for the tech team? I mean, they are just sensational. They, they always get forgotten, um, but um, they're running around the in the background, frantically peddling away. Um, I was even getting updates saying, there's two more slides to go, there's three more slides to go. So brilliant um so thank you to, to you guys you're very often underappreciated um so as i promised there was going to be um a a question for you so i'm going to ask everybody to stand up please and i'm sure you're very grateful for this opportunity anyway because you've been sitting through this uh, for an hour and a half okay so um now i'm going to ask all the apnic staff to sit down because <laughs> you don't get to participate sorry um but um, it also gives you the opportunity to look around and see who these brilliant people are and um and to just send them a little bit of love and appreciation <clears throat> um okay so now for the rest of you do we have that slide yet not yet <laughs> just, um otherwise you can go back to andre's presentation um slide 21 i think it was ah there it is ta-da okay so for the rest of you i would like to know how many of these products that we have have you interacted with so let's start off with everybody who's standing um if you haven't interacted with any one of them you may take a seat well you're all members so oh yeah except <laughs> Um, okay, we have some visitors from overseas, from IPNCC. Thank you, Felipe. You may take a seat. Um, so, um, and then for the rest of you, how many of you have interacted with more than more than two? So at least two products. Okay, let's go up to three. Okay, anyone who has interacted with with more than five? Ooh. There's still a lot of you standing. This is fantastic. Okay. So more than five products that you've interacted with are still standing. Okay. Anyone who's interacted with more than eight? Ooh, I think that we may just have some. Oh, wait. Wait. Is eight the most? I think we have two winners. I mean, you guys have to, you, you guys have to be the winners. So please, what I would like you to do is um, go to the products and services uh, lounge and you will get a beautiful new APNIC member shirt. So both of you, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, if you don't know where that is, where's Poopadoo? Is he still here? What did he have to run? Just ask for Pupadu or Tuan. And for those of you that are in our Japanese community, Pupadu speaks Japanese. So um, so apart from Georgia Dagi, who is uh, who also speaks Japanese, um, you can actually talk to Pupadu. He lived here for about five years. So he um he's yeah, seven. Yeah. Okay, there we go. About five. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming in today. And um, and for those of you who are interacting with these products, wonderful. Go and explore them. Um, especially Orbit. I'm going to give a shameless plug to Orbit. Uh, that's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for you to stay engaged with the community in between conferences. So thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the conference.